Hello, everyone. This is the 121st episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles and the Soccer Nostalgia blog. And I'm joined by Paul from Shipley in England and the 1888 Letter blog. For this episode, we interview Mr. Simon McMichael. As we discuss Genoa in the years 1992, Mr. McMichael is a Scottish Genoa fan living in London. Welcome, Simon. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Your introduction to Genoa is certainly unique as a Scotsman. Can you discuss your trajectory? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure it's unique as a Scotsman because... The first time I went to Marassi, you know, the, the stadium where Genoa played, there were 15,000 Scots there that day. It was the World Cup in 1990, and that was my first ever day in Italy. It turned out to be a life-changing day. And we're playing Sweden in the World Cup. I went out a couple of days after we lost Costa Rica in the same stadium. Thank you. But I found myself in Genoa, my first ever day in Italy, went to the stadium, and we were on, on the sword, on the Grand Nata sword, as Scottish fans, mixing with Swedish fans as well. And I found myself looking towards Grand Nata North, which had a lot of banners up there. And there was a thing at the time in Genoa fans, Scottish clan. And there was this lovely Sushane, on the Nord, Scottish clan, looking at Scotland play. And I thought, oh, well, I need to investigate this team. And just, you know, chatting to people in Genova that weekend and probably also looking at the time for an Italian team I could maybe follow. I met so many lovely Genova fans. And that was obviously the team I was going to go for. Do you have any sense at that time of, of the history of the club and... Anything of the, I the background? Uh, no, and I I didn't. And that's a really interesting question because, you know, I'm on an age, I'm, I'm older than you guys, I think, right? I'm on an age where back then, 1990, Sampdoria was the club that actually signed a lot of British and Irish players, English, Scottish, Irish players around that time. So we had uh, Colin Francis, Liam Brady, you know, we, we had so many players from the British Isles who played in the cycling shirt, right? Yeah. And so Sampdoria was like a team that was really well known in the UK at that time. Genoa was not. But you know what? I didn't meet a single Sampdoria fan in Genoa that weekend. I met a lot of Genoa fans. As far as the history, it was founded in 1893. So they've 1893. Had a, yeah. So yep. they've had a long history, but once we reached the 1980s, 1990s, they've had a lot of ups and downs back to Serie B, Serie A. So they're not a force at this point. They're one of those sides whose only objective is to, to just to maintain themselves in the, in the Serie A at best. At this point, uh, is a is a huge city, right? It's what one of the five big cities in in Italy, and it's a very historic city, and it deserves a big club. Now that big club, I think, in the future, hopefully, will be us. But it's an historic club. We know this, right? We know, we know it's the oldest club in Italy, the oldest football club in Italy. We know it has so much history behind it. And it's got a little history ahead of it, I think. But it's like some of these clubs you have in, in England, let's say. You know, a club like, let's say, a club like Wolves won lots of league titles back in the day. And they're back up the, in the, the Premier League now. You know, it's an historic club. It's a club that's won loads of trophies. But we need to get back to better things. And that's Wolves, that's Genoa. That's, there's so many clubs everywhere like that. But the important thing is we have history behind us. And at the time of the uh, the World Cup, 
What did you know about Serie A? Were you, were you quite familiar with it? There wasn't really a lot on British television at that time. It was still a few years away before we got the regular live games and, and regular footage. There really wasn't. You're right. I started teaching myself a little bit of Italian before I went out. Seriously, I, I landed at Malpanza Airport in Milan. Lunchtime of the day I went to see Got and Play Sweden. And, you know, we ended up at uh, Marassi and watched the game. And it was, you know, Scotland won. I mean, that is 34 years ago. That's the last time Scotland won a match in a finals tournament. It's insane, right? And then we went and spent a couple of days on the coast before going up to Turin for the Brazil game, which we lost to a late goal. And that trip, that convinced me. I was in my mid-twenties and I hadn't been to university. But that trip and learning Italian convinced me to actually, yeah, maybe I should go to university. I went to university and among other things, I studied Italian, which was life-changing. You know, that the whole trip, that whole trip changed my life. Absolutely. I can't tell you what the atmosphere of Italia 90 was like. It was incredible. You know, even going to, we went on to Finale Ligre, we spent a couple of days there, you know, on the coast. What, six kilometers west of Genova. And everyone was just buzzing with the whole World Cup. It was terrific. We often, in our podcast, we discuss how, for both of us, how 1982 World Cup change our lives as football fans but we were like nine years old you were a little bit older at this point in 1990 but nevertheless um, it changed yes. the trajectory of your life as a fan Absolutely. and everything yeah just to give a background genoa had been promoted back to the Serie A in 1989 so 1989-90 was their first season back and their manager was the well-respected francesco scolio professor that first season back, he was able to guide the team to a mid-table position. They finished 11th that season. That was the season where, for their foreign player policy, they decided to sign an Uruguayan trio of Ruben Paz, Jose Perdomo, and Carlos Aguilera. And Aguilera would be one who would be make the greatest impact. Others who came on board include the veteran Fulvio Colovati, a 1982 World Cup champion. The team already included the likes of Simon Braglia in goal, Nicola Caricola, former Juventus player, Armando Ferroni, the veterans Gianluca Signorini and Vincenzo Torrente in defense. We have the young Stefano Erranio, who would become an international in a few years' time. You know, Valeriano Fiorin, Davide Fontolan, who would later join Inter after this season, the young Gennaro Ruotolo, you mentioned your favorite player, or one of your Absolutely. favorite players. Yeah. And the veteran Massimo Briaschi, who had played for Juventus a few years before. So at this point, some of the be part of this adventure that we will discuss were already on board be the following season where with your new manager that everything would change. So I'm going to tell you first off, I'm going to tell you about my first general match. I went to university quite late. I went in uh, my mid-20s, autumn 1991. Before I went to university, I spent a month doing an interrail trip around Europe, you know, which for North American people, that's a Eurail trip. So, you know, it's a trip on trains, right? I wanted to go back to Genoa, and I wanted to see Genoa play there. And our first game of the season was against Cremonese. So this is the, the 1991-92 season. And played Cremonese, and I went to the game, and I had a great time, and I met a lot of Genoani who were loved to me and everything. And I was chatting to them in a bit of a mix of Italian and English. They found out I was on an interrail ticket. They said, well, where are you going after this? And I said, well, I'm going to, I'm going down to Corfu for a week down in Greece. Then I'm coming back up. Then I'm going to see Scotland playing Switzerland. And then I'm going to, before I go back to the UK, I'm going to Barcelona. 
and they're like, Barcelona, Spain. I'm like, well, Catalonia. But no, it's Spain, Spain. You're going to Spain. I'm like, yeah. You're going to Spain. You have to come to Oviedo. I'm like, right? Because Genoa is playing in Oviedo. It is the first ever Genoa match in a European competition. Copy Eiffel, 1991. And so I ended up getting this overnight train that took hours and hours and hours and hours up to the very northwest of Spain, into Oviedo, getting to the station in the morning. There's 6,000 Genoa fans there. There's also the local miners on strike, so they're having a party. And it was also the Fiesta de San Mateo. So the whole city is having a fiesta. And honestly, I have been to football matches all over Europe. That is one of the best parties I've ever had. 6,000 Genoa fans in town. The mines are on strike, so they're kind of having a bit of a party. And it was local fiesta. Genoa went through that round. You know, we, we took them back to Morassi and beat Oviedo. And then I went to Cardiff and started my university. And I didn't realise at the time that a couple months later, I'd be at Anfield at Liverpool and see them make history. Summer of 1990, following Italian 90, Francesco Scolio left Genoa after a row with Spinelli. Spinelli hires Osvaldo Bagnoli. Yep. And let's remind ourselves, Osvaldo Bagnoli had led Verona to the Serie A title in 1985. But by 1990, him and the team had been relegated. He was hired, I imagine, for the required minimum of keeping the team in the Serie A. To give a background of Bagnoli, he had a playing career in the 1950s and 60s with the likes of AC Milan, Verona, Udinese, among others. And he had started his managerial career in the 1970s with the likes of Como and Cesena before finding success with Verona by promoting them in 1982 and winning the Scudetto in 1985. For this very crucial 1990-91 season, Genoa signs the likes of midfielders like Mario Bortolazzi from Atalanta, Roberto Onorati from Avellino, Marco Paccione, a striker from Torino, and more importantly, Tomas Kuravi, the Czech striker from Sparta Prague, who became a star of Italian 90 by scoring five goals. Later in the season, they also signed Brazilian defender Branco from Porto. Aguilera had been maintained from the previous season. So the three foreigners that season were Skuravi and Aguilera up front with Branco in defense. This new team with Bagnoli in charge takes some time to get going. In the beginning, Skuravi also struggled to settle in the team and was not scoring goals. But the turning point was the win over neighbors Sampdoria on November 25th, where Genoa dramatically win this match 2-1 with a brilliant free kick by Branco. After this, they slowly got up the table and Skuravi started scoring goals more regularly and formed a lethal partnership with Aguilera at the top. And Stefano Errani also would be rewarded with a cap with the Azzurri. So by the end of the season, finished in the fourth position and qualified for the UEFA Cup for the first time in history. Not only that, Sampdoria managed to win the Scudetto, so it was a special year for the city of Genoa, this uh, year 1991. 
not only Erania was rewarded with a cap, but Gennaro Ruotolo also earned a cap at the end of the season. We have to discuss how the foreign trio of Aguilera, Scuravi, and Branco was one of the best examples of intelligent and complementary recruitment. In previous times, after such a successful season, a team like Genoa would be forced to sell off its best assets to the bigger teams. But Genoa resisted this trend. And in the summer of 1991, Juventus wanted to sign Ruotolo. Roma were eyeing Torrente. And I think Milan were looking at Eranio. And even Scuravi was a potential target for Olympic Marseille. But Spinelli held on to them as Genoa were to embark on this magical UEFA Cup adventure for 1991-92 season. Um, I think there's something important that you're overlooking there, which is something of the period, and you know it doesn't exist now, which is back then, a club in Serie A could only sign three foreigners, right? So... After Scotland got knocked out of the World Cup in 1990, I went to the last 16 game at San Siro between West Germany and the Netherlands, right? And there will never be a football match like this again, ever. West Germany, in their team, they had Jürgen Klinsmann, they had Bremer, and they had Matthias. All of them, Inter players. And the Netherlands had Van Basten, Hullet, and Rijkaard. So the three foreigners who played for Inter were playing there at San Siro for West Germany. The three foreign players from Milan were playing there that night for the Netherlands. That will never, ever happen again. That you have, I mean, Netherlands against West Germany, that is a local derby anyway as an international. But it was a Milan derby, yeah? You will never, ever see a football match like that again. I'm sitting there on the Tazanel, or the, the top tier of the San Siro. And I've got Dutchmen sitting next to me. I've got Germans sitting next to me. I have Milan fans sitting next to me. I have Inter fans sitting next to me. It's one of the most incredible atmospheres I've ever known. But it is important to note, I think, that, you know, back in those days... You could only, as a Serie A club, you could only sign three foreigners. And I think you're right. Three that we signed, they weren't bad, were they? You know, they, they were top-class players. You know, and I loved Aguilera. And then later, you know, Scaravi. They were absolutely top-notch. And then you have other people you signed, like Johnny Van Sheep, you know, the, the Dutch guy. They were all good signings. Come this following season, with with Genoa about to play in the the UEFA Cup, what was your involvement, and what was the time at which you started actually going over to Italy to watch the team? So after going to Genoa and watching Scotland in you know World Cup ninety, I really wanted to go back to a match there and actually watch Genoa play. And when I did my interrail before going to university, that's when the, the opportunity presented itself. And so I went to see Genoa play the opening game of the season in 1991 against Cremonese. And I, I didn't really realise at the time how big a season it was going to be for Genoa. Quickly, it wasn't a club we knew much about back in Great Britain. Sampdoria was the team we heard about more here because they signed a lot of British and Irish players, you know, Liam Brady, Graham Souness, Trevor Francis, you know, all the others. But I decided that it was going to be my team in Italy because when I'd been there during the World Cup, the fans were so friendly and so welcoming to us. And so I went and saw them play Cremonese, and as I said, I was told they were going to be playing in Spain a few weeks later, so I went out and watched that. 
and I started following the European adventure and it was brilliant. It was it was fantastic. You know, there I am in the stadium in Oviedo, half time the stadium. I bump into Paddy Branco, you know, in, in his suit from you know Genoa. He was injured, he wasn't playing in the game. But he was with the fans that day. And I couldn't really speak Italian at the time. And he's Brazilian. He couldn't really speak Italian either. But kind of made it known that I'm Scottish and you're Brazilian. And you were playing in Torino last year, the World Cup. And it was like, ah, Scotsman, like, boom, boom, Alex McLeish. And Alex McLeish gave him a black eye, apparently, with his elbow. Uh, we had a little chat about that. And being in Oviedo with 6,000 Genoani, I mean, you know, I, I was made to feel, even though it was only my second ever match, I was made to feel such a huge part of the Genoa family. Besides Ral Oviedo in the first round, then the second round, there's the elimination of Romanian Dinamo Bucharest, and then following that, Stoya Bucharest. But then we come to the quarterfinals against Liverpool. Liverpool. Yeah. So I guess one lucky thing is that I was at university in Wales. And in Wales at the time, they actually showed Italian football highlights on the Monday evening. And this is just before English football, English, English TV started covering Italian football. So actually, you know, I'd, I'd be watching Welsh language TV and watching Genoa. And so, so that was great for that season. And, you know, one of my friends from university said, right, I've got some tickets to go and watch Genoa at Anfield against Liverpool. Would you like one? And I'm like, what? I'm actually, you know, a Genoa fan. Yeah, let's, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. And so we got the train. Myself, Sean, my friend Sean, and Giuseppe, despite the name, is actually from Finsbury Park in London. But the three of us went up to Liverpool to watch Genoa at Anfield. So we were there. You know, we were there. And we got the train up. And, you know, we get into Liverpool and we get to the game. And we were sitting, I suppose, as a Genoa fan, just so you, as, as you look at the pitch, we were just to the right of where the Genoa end was. Obviously, the game went well for Genoa. It maybe was not about to go so well for us because some bloke behind us was like, hey, 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 let's call this here, support the fight dice. We were about to get into a lot of trouble. Now, I've been to Anfield enough times that I, I went straight to a copper and said, look, I think we're going to get our heads kicked in here, mate. Could you get us into the away end? And he needed a little bit of convincing. But for the second half, we were in with the Genoa fans in the away end. And it was incredible. You know, the atmosphere and, you know, Genoa, you know, in those days, you know, not a big club or anything. The first ever Italian club to win at Anfield. And that is, that's a huge thing. I mean, everyone wins at Anfield these days, but, you know, back then, it was that Anfield was a fortress. And Genoa went there and won. And it was fantastic. And let's remind everyone, the first leg at Genoa, Genoa won 2-0. This return match on March 18th, Genoa won 2-1 to advance to the semifinals. However, in the semifinals, they were stopped by the Ajax of Dennis Burkamp and Aaron Winter and John Van Skip, among others. One round too many. But nevertheless, it was an exceptional European adventure for a team like Genoa. I wouldn't say exceptional. I would argue with that. Yes, it is exceptional in terms of our history, but the fact that Genoa has only ever had two European campaigns, that's criminal. Like Genoa, a club as big as Genoa, and it is a big club, 
a club as big as Genoa should, in 40-odd years, 30, 40 years, it should have done more than two European campaigns. We're not a little club, we're a big club, but a badly managed big club. Success has its price, and Spinelli could no longer hold on to his best assets for a second season. And for 92-93 season, many of the players of his stars would leave. This included Stefano Eranio, who joined AC Milan, Carlos Aguilera, who joined Torino, but more importantly, the manager, Osvaldo Bagnoli, who had masterminded his success, he joined Inter. The arrivals included the likes of Igor Dobrovolsky, the former Soviet midfielder. There's like the Juventus veteran goalkeeper Stefano Tacconi were not enough. As well as we should mention, John Van Skip also arrived from Ajax. And a new manager, Claudio Mazzelli. So this 92-93 season would not be as memorable as Genoa would finish in mid-table in 13th place. You mentioned you lived in Pavia. Yeah, I started in Pavia the season after that, 93-94. I imagine you managed to watch Genoa more regularly while there. So yeah, I had the opportunity of going to Italy for a year at university and really the two choices where I went to, one was Parma, and if you remember at the time, Parma were actually a very successful side. But the other place was Pavia, which is about a third of the way between Milan and Genoa. And I decided to go to study in Pavia, partly because I I like Milan. Partly because there were fewer of us studying there, so it was like more intimate. But above all, because it was easier to get to go and see Genoa. Yep. So, you know, I rocked up there. And most Sundays when I was living there, I was either getting the train down to Genoa for, you know, to go to the game, and, you know, get out of the station and turn left and Boom, boom. Or I was going to away matches, and those were a bit of an experience, you know, in good ways and bad ways. And it was a, it was an absolutely terrific season. And I was also, you know, my local bar. You know, I wasn't just the foreigner who was in the local bar, where the people who ran it, they're all like either Inter or Juve fans. I wasn't just a foreigner who went there. I was like the the Genoa fan who went there. You know, I was, I was seen as someone very strange because, you know, very few people in general, outside Genoa, support Genoa. One thing I do remember, though, is the guy who ran the local bar said, well, you know, I said, oh, I I need to go and have a haircut. Where do I go? He's like, oh, no, no, you have to go to Georgia. I was like, what? Yeah, go to Georgia. And he's like, in the street, in the the middle of here. Go to Georgia. And you'll understand why when you get there. I'm like, okay. So I go to this barber's in uh, the middle of Pavia. Go in. And all the barber's seats, they're red and blue. And all over the walls was photos of the historic Genoa teams and everything. And I walked in and I, yeah, I found my place. And of course, every time he's cut my hair, we just talk about uh, the latest match and you know, Casey Sala, you know, let's stay up. And yeah, that's another thing is that wherever you go in Italy, you will find people who are either from Genoa and support Genoa or have that family history. I went to see him a couple of years ago um, against Spal in Ferrara. Yeah. And I'm getting the train there from Modena. And on a station in between, father and son get on both in Genoa shirts. Turns out the father, you know, is from, from Genoa, but moved to Mila Romagna. But he's passed on his Genoanita to his son. They were both Rossoblu. 
And during this period, when you were going to, to games regularly, did you same part of the ground? Did you get to know people, other fans from, go, from going more regularly? So I'd always have my same route to get to the stadium. You know, it was kind of through the centre of historical of, of Genoa. Then I dropped down. There was always one bar I went into, which appears to have gone now. Last time I looked, it was a kebab shop. But then I was going to a little place underneath uh, the Grand Nathan Nord. And the Grand Nathan Nord is like the Genoa home end. And there's a bar there called a Little Club. And I'll come back to this a little bit later in this conversation, right? Uh, it's called a Little Club. It's very much, very much Genoa fan club. And I go in there and I always remember, and you know, like I said, this is going back 30 years now. I go in there and it was always just like uh, every single home game I went to, there was this guy who, I said an old bloke, but he's probably like the age then that I am now. But we'd all, he was always there on his own and I'd come in and we'd, we'd always have a little chat. Yep. About how the game's going to go, blah, blah, blah. Boom. Then we go our separate ways and watch the match. But one thing I do remember is uh, a few years later, when Genoa played in the final of the Anglo Italian Cup against Port Vale at Wembley and won it, I was at Piccadilly Circuit the, the day before the game. And I bumped into a load of people there who turned out all to be from from that little club, Genoa, underneath Grand Latin Nord. And that was lovely. I mean, you know, we're talking about the same people and yeah. It's a very family thing. Let's discuss the aftermath with the the first relegation in 1995 that kind of ended this adventure of the 1990s. I didn't really follow that so either. I mean, I followed it from afar. I followed it through the pages of the Gazette of the Spot and the odd bit on TV. And then I was back in Pavia for the last weekend of it, and I was in a bar watching the county shootout. I was gutted. That's all I really remember about that. The decisive playoff with Padova on June 10th, 1995, to determine which team would be relegated and which team would stay up in the Serie A. This match ended as a 1-1 tie, Padova won 5-4 on a penalty kick shootout. Thank you for the reminder. But... Um, I was wondering about the, the following season. You mentioned the Anglo-Italian Cup. Did you go to different games ahead of the Wembley final during that season? I was still kind of living in Cardiff at the time. You know, post I'd graduated, but I was still kind of living in Cardiff. And I was on my way to watch, you know, bizarrely, I was on my way to watch Scotland play Finland in Glasgow. And this is gonna this is gonna show how old I am. You know, I was a skint student and I decided I was gonna hitchhike from Cardiff to Glasgow. Do you remember hitchhiking? You know, the whole what well, the Italians call out of stop, right? So I'm hitchhiking. And I'm going through Birmingham. I was like, hang on, Genoa are playing in Birmingham tonight. So okay, I'll go and watch that. And so I went to see Genoa play Birmingham City, Anglo Italian Cup. And that was my first ever time at St Andrews, the Birmingham City ground. And Genoa won. And I think, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, there weren't many Genoa fans in the stadium that night. I may have been the only one. And I had my Genoa scarf on. I had a lovely, lovely Genoa scarf, probably from the period there. And a little girl next to me, who was there with her dad, supporting Birmingham City. She was a bit upset about Birmingham losing, so I gave her my scarf. Yeah, little memento. So maybe there's someone about 30 years old now. There's a young woman in Birmingham right now 
who's become a Genoa fan because of that. I do not know. I do not know. But yeah, so that was one of the early rounds of the thing. And then we, we got to the final at Wembley. I happened to be in the West End the day before the match, Piccadilly Circus, and I bumped into my mates from the, the little club at Piccadilly Circus. And I got interviewed by Italian TV, by, well, local Genoa TV, at Piccadilly mm-hmm. Circus about, you're a Scottish person, you know, you're watching Genoa, why? Right. And I, I went to one with my friends the day after, and it was fantastic. And I think many people outside England realised how bigger thing, certainly back then, it was for a, a team like Genoa to be playing at Wembley. Nowadays, you know, we have all the playoffs and everything. Wembley used to be a big thing. It used to be a huge thing about playing there. Clear, you know, it was mythical for people from abroad. It was, you know, the home of football. And so if Genoa would be playing there, and not just playing there, but to uh, actually go there and absolutely stuff Port Vale, it was a huge thing. And I think it was a, a big thing in Genoa's history. The other thing I'll add about that day, it was just after Dunblane. We don't have school shootings here, but we had that one school shooting in Dunblane, in Scotland, just before Genoa played Port Vale at Wembley. And they were making a minute silence for the kids and the teacher who got killed there. And I'll never, ever, ever forget this. I will never forget this. The announcer came over the, the, the stadium tannoy in English and said, I have a message for the Port Vale fans. We're making a minute silence in memory of the children and teacher who were killed in Dunblane last week. The Italian fans, the Genoa fans, will probably start clapping. That is not a sign of disrespect. That is the way they pay their respects. Because in Italy, you don't do a minute silence, you do a minute applause. And so the minute silence starts. And yeah, sure enough, all the Genoa fans around me start clapping. And honestly, I, I'm just so overjoyed, the announcer, that the stadium people were that culturally aware that they knew that was going to happen and that they, they flagged it up as, uh, you know, this could be an issue. And to tell Port Vale fans, that's what's going to happen. And so it ended up like everyone's respect as one. The years that followed, did you continue to to watch the team as closely, did you had you formed that bond already? Would you say that continued even through the the leaner years that that followed relegation? No, I mean I kept an eye on results. I went to the odd game, but not really. So I think the next question is: I think the next question probably is how I started getting most faith again, and that's three, four years ago, five years ago. For a few years, I obviously followed the results in the media and everything and they're getting increasingly frustrated. And all that time, I was trying to see whether there was a general club here in the UK. And there wasn't, you know, not at the time. And then one day, bam, it actually popped up on, on Facebook or something. There was a general club here. And we meet in a pub near Victoria, the Constitution, for pretty much every home game. And so I started, you know, it's five years ago, I started going to games again. Going to actually watch games with other Genoa fans, which actually makes a difference, because it's a huge difference. Even there's like one other person there, who is one of the person who gets the fact that you support the same team, you know, you can moan about the result together. Yeah, it's different to just trying to deal with it all on your own. It's more than one person. I mean, we, we get 30-odd people there for, you know, big matches in the in the room in this pub. And a lot of us now get out to, to games in Italy together. You know, whether that's 
Amarasi or away games. You know, we have a great time. We've got a good thing going there. We've suffered the Serie A B, you know, last couple of years. And then get back into Serie A this year. And there have been good results, been bad results. But now we're safe. There's going to be Serie A again next year. And yeah, we have a good thing going. And you know, Genoa, this team has been going for 130 years. It's not going anywhere. It's going to last another 130 at least. Is yeah. there any particular factor that you know led you to maybe reconnect as a fan? Would you say there was a particular spark for that, or did, or did it just kind of happen yeah. that you you felt more more engaged again as a fan? Genoa has always been my team in Italy, and I suppose life got in the way a little bit. I got married, I got separated, I got a dog, I couldn't go to Italy that much. And then, like, recent years, I've been able to go to Italy a lot more. It was absolutely, particularly, it was finding General Club UK that really lit the fire under me again, I guess. Because, yeah, I could go and watch the game with people who support the same team I do. It's really, really not the same when you're sitting at home on your own in Oxfordshire and trying to watch the game on a dodgy feed in your laptop or something compared to being in a pub in Pimlico with 20 other people, all of you supporting the same team, you know, and, you know, being part of that community. Yeah, I've always been Genoano, but for me, it's a road that's best followed with other people who are suffering it rather than suffer it on your own, if that makes sense. Your passion as a fan, was it stronger in the beginning or has it progressively getting stronger through the years? That's absolutely got stronger over the years. Yes, absolutely. When I go to Genoa, and I go there you know, a couple of times a year now, I always make sure I stay in the place called Bocadasso, which is, it's just on the eastern edge of the city. And one of the things it's famous for is it has a, a tiny little stony beach there, but just off the beach, there are rocks. And on those rocks, there is a very famous flag of Genoa. Not Genoa, but Genoa, right? And you'll see this on... It, have you seen the TV programme? It's on the TV programme. The guy's going out to put the flag up. The dad says it's an old fishing village. And it is very, very, very Russell Blue. It's very, you know, it really is part of the identity of, of, of being a Genoa fan. It's also Bogdasse. I always make sure I go and stay there. Yeah, I absolutely, you know. Okay, I lived for a year in Pavia an hour and a half way on the train. And in all that year in Pavia, I never spent one night in Genoa. I went to loads of games, but I never spent a night there. So I didn't really know the city. Whereas now, if I go to a match, I'm spending one, two, three nights there. I've actually got to know the city and its people a lot better over the years since then. Yeah, absolutely. In closing, what is the future look like in terms of your your fandom with Genoa? The future of my fandom, the future of my Genoanita, if we can use that that word, which is impossible to translate into English. The future of that would be this team. I think we've got a great group of players right now and a great manager. And I think we can build on this. My aspiration for next year would be we can actually challenge for a place in the European competition. Whether that will happen or not, I don't know. But you know, at least consolidate ourselves in Serie A. I think in a country like Italy, it's actually difficult to, to challenge the bigger established clubs. You know, you Inter, Milan, Juve, there's so much money. It is really, really difficult to break into that. I'm not saying it's possible, 
but it is really, really difficult. Having said that, my long-term ambition, I hope it's one that gets realised one day, is that maybe within 10 years, we do, through our merits on the pitch, we do get the 10th title. Because you, you, you know what this means to Genoa fans, right? Because we were robbed of our 10th title 100 years ago. Otherwise, we would have the star on the shirt. One day, we will get that 10th title. And I hope I'm still alive when that happens. And that would make their case of being Genoa. That would make them worthwhile. In the meantime, you know, here I am. This is my team. It's the team I follow in Italy. And I love them. With that, we'd like to thank you for your participation in this interview. As always, feel free to leave questions and comments. All our respective contact information is listed on the blog and podcast listings. So Simon, thank you once again for sharing your memories. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Much appreciated.